The secret yearning for death, the glory beyond and the death beyond. Everything was beyond, wrong or right, had always been beyond. Are you going to give that up? His heart in spasm because he was always in contact with the ocean's dark swell and the lofty light from the edge of the clouds, twisting, withering until it clogged and then swelling up again, and he unable to distinguish the most exalted feelings from the meanest, and that not mattering really, since he could hold the sea responsible. Are you going to give up that luminous freedom? Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today I'm going to be talking about the first novel that I've ever read from Yukio Mishima. This is The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea. And I'm also going to be talking about Paul Schrader's 1985 film put out by the great Criterion Collection, Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters. This of course continues my acquaintance, my discovery, my journey through modern Japanese literature. The last video I did was on Kawabata's Snow Country, and as it turns out, Kawabata was a mentor of Mishima's, but they were yin and yang. Still waiting on my Donald Keene book about the beauty, the pleasure of Japanese literature to come in. I don't know what's going on with the mail system, but I need that book. Anyhow, we're told that one of the most recognizable icons of modern Japan is none other than Yukio Mishima. He has long been a sort of Zen paradox, a deeply reflective writer who craved the limelight, and a boxer and bodybuilder with a powerful intellect and a penchant for self-promotion whose meticulously orchestrated ritual suicide, or seppuku, shocked the nation. He is the yang antithesis of his unlikely literary mentor, Kawabata. Kawabata being the yin prototype who epitomized sensitivity and lyrical understatement. So in the figure of Yukio Mishima, we have the warrior-obsessed tough guy, Ubermensch. We have the literary icon and an author who is one of the voyeurs in our culture who wanted to flip the script and make himself as a writer voyeurized. Speaking of deep writing and bodybuilding, has anyone else checked out R.E. Young or Ray Young's The Ironsmith? Wonderful book. Marcus goes on to say that the Wagnerian dimension of Mishima's life is epitomized by his embrace of Bambu Ryodo, the twin paths of literary pursuit and the warrior's way, the Bushido for a post-Bushido age. And indeed, Yukio Mishima was obsessed with bringing the lifestyle, the code of the samurai, back to the Japan of the 50s and 60s, when so much of Japan was giving over to westernized capitalist yearnings and what Mishima saw as spiritual impoverishment. He wanted to reinstate loyalty to the emperor and The Code of the Warrior. Arguably his finest novel, The Temple of the Golden Pavilion, is an elaborate fictionalization of a 1950 incident in which the famous Kyoto Temple was set on fire and destroyed by a deranged Buddhist acolyte. And in fact, it will be The Temple of the Golden Pavilion, which I ordered immediately after reading that and haven't read yet, but it will be incorporated into Schrader's film beautifully. I want to talk about the film first because I think it's a perfect biopic, a perfect entryway into the life and work of Mishima. In some ways, I wish I had watched it first. Like I said, this is directed by Paul Schrader. It's put out by the fantastic Criterion Collection in this beautiful Blu-ray slipcased edition that includes this great glossy high-res booklet and an essay by Kevin Jackson. The executive producers behind this film were none other than Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas. Eiko Ishioka was the production designer. She would go on to work with Ford Coppola on Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is another lavish, beautiful, colorful set. It also boasts an incredible score by none other than Philip Glass. 
The film is very beautifully designed. There are three strands, as Jackson notes in his essay. The first strand is what we start off with, and this is shot in the present. It's, you know, full on color, just a normal looking composition and colorful view of contemporary life. And it starts with the fateful morning of November 25th, 1970, which was to be Mishima's last day on earth. He put his last chapter of his last book, which was The Decay of the Angel, in the mail for his publisher. And then with four of his comrades in his private army, the Shield Society, he drove to the headquarters of the Japanese army in Tokyo. And with this elaborate ruse, he took one of the generals hostage and stepped out onto the roof and started on this diatribe to the army. But he found that his view of the way things should be, his loyalty to the emperor, the code of the samurai, uniting pen and sword, which is uh, reiterated throughout the film, was falling on deaf ears. The, this new generation of Japanese didn't care for this, and they were shouting him to knock it off, basically. Well, he went back in the room and committed ritual seppuku, which is he cut open his own entrails, and then one of his comrades beheaded him with uh, his own sword. But this is given to us in stages. It is the frame around the film, such as Scheherazade's frame around the tales in the Arabian Nights. Interspersed with that are black and white flashbacks to Mishima's actual life growing up and going from this silent, sickly, gangly child to this muscle-bound superstar. The four chapters are beauty, art, action, and then the wonderfully titled Harmony of Pen and Sword. Beauty gives us a art installation-like set design that really sets it apart from the black and white flashbacks and the full color present frame tale and is based on Mishima's book, The Temple of the Golden Pavilion. Art is another wonderful set that gives us a dramatization of Mishima's Kyoko's house. And it's during this that we get a line that exemplifies so much of Mishima. A man's desire to become beautiful is always a desire for death. The action chapter is based on runaway horses, and there's a particularly striking exchange where a character tells Mishima purity, 100% true purity, is not attainable in this world. To which Mishima replies, it is if your life is a line of poetry written in blood. And then, of course, in the fourth chapter, this is the closing of the frame tale and the seppuku for which Mishima is probably most well known. Kevin Jackson's essay in this Criterion Collection Blu-ray is wonderful, and he opens it up with a contrast between Mishima and Oscar Wilde because Oscar Wilde was also obsessed with beauty. He also was an esthete. He also had these striking aphorisms. But Jackson wants to show that the difference is that Wilde is basically all talk. Jackson says Oscar Wilde went on to let his body decay. He grew jowls and got slack. Whereas Mishima decided that after the age of 40, man just decays and there's no good and going on. And Mishima wanted to put into practice the obsession with beauty that he talked about, and he worked to transform his own body into a work of art. Hence, Mishima saw that at his peak, that is when he should end his life here on Earth. This is the perfect culmination of beauty and death. So now let's talk about the book that I read, my introduction to the actual work of Mishima, the sailor who fell from grace with the sea. I was in no way prepared for how beautiful, terrifying, and powerful this book is. It's divided into two parts, summer and winter. Summer represents, of course, life in its full flourishing, and in winter, death. It's told in the omniscient third person. It follows the principal characters, Noboru, the 13-year-old boy, his mother, and then the sailor. In general, the writing, which is so poetic and so lashing, gives the book an earthy physicality like the best of Neruda's poems. 
the boy, Naburu, lost his father five years ago when he was eight years old. He's just been living with his mother. He has an erotic fascination with her that is a recurring theme in Mishima's work. He also has a fascination with the sea and with sailors in general, even before Ryuji comes along, that reminds me of Ishmael on the opening page of Moby Dick. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off. Then I account it high time to get to the sea as soon as I can. But of course, Ishmael is a lot more lighthearted and funny. Noburu is quite deadly serious. In fact, he's part of a gang of boys for which he is the third in command to a chief who is horrifying. The chief is up there with the judge in Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. But things are primed for Noboru such that when Ryuji meets his mother and they join together, Ryuji becomes for Noboru the ubermensch who represents the triumph over humanity, over uh, mortality, over the restrictions in this world. Absolute freedom. Noboru has a way of spying on his mother in her bedroom and the night that he witnesses Eros and Thanatos come together for himself because of course for Mishima imputed through Noboru these two things are completely intertwined but this coupling with his priming for both the mother and the father. This is something that would have sent Freud into hysterics if this had been published in his lifetime. We have the, the perfect Oedipus complex here. However, part of his gang's mantra, their credo, their code, is that the world is a lie, art is a lie, fathers are the worst things that can be because they are sitting there trying to restrict you and tell you what's right and wrong and what you should do when they themselves have settled down. They have grown slack. They're no longer aspiring to be the ubermensch of youth. And so when Noboru first tells the gang of Ryuji, the sailor who personifies the exact values that they're looking for, the chief and the rest of them are sort of uncertain, but they're allowing Noboru to have his dalliance with this idea. We get this language and these descriptions that culminate with this turning point in Noboru's life. Though he must have been nearly the same age as Noboru's mother, talking about Ryuji, his body looked younger and more solid than any landsman's. It might have been cast in the matrix of the sea. His broad shoulders were square as the beams in a temple roof, his chest strained against a thick mat of hair, knotted muscle like twists of sisal hemp bulged all over his body. His flesh looked like a suit of armor that he could cast off at will. Speaking of Fusako, Noboru's mom and Ryuji's lover, her nose was perfect, her lips exquisite, like a master ringing a go stone onto the board. After long deliberation, he placed the details of her beauty one by one in the misty dark and drew back to savor them. But while all this is going on and stirring up Noboru's imagination, the gang is drilling this mantra. Real danger is nothing more than just living. Of course, living is merely the chaos of existence, but more than that, it's a crazy mixed up business of dismantling existence instant by instant to the point where the original chaos is restored and taking strength from the uncertainty and the fear that chaos brings to recreate existence instant by instant. You won't find another job as dangerous as that. There isn't any fear in existence itself or any uncertainty, but living creates it. And society is basically meaningless, a Roman mixed bath. And school, school is just society in miniature. And that's why we're always being ordered around. A bunch of blind men tell us what to do, tear our unlimited ability to shreds. And so this group of 13 year old boys is rather terrifying because they're getting themselves so worked up and hyped up that 
you know, they're set apart. They're, they're above everybody. They're above society. They have unlimited ability, whereas everyone else has feeble, limited ability. In our time of radical nationalist groups and so on, this is rather terrifying to read. It reminds me of reading Columbine by David Cullen, where he went into the details of the two boys who shot up the school there in Colorado. Horrifying. We find that this group of boys, they have been inflicting violence on stray animals in order to build up their fortitude against having any emotion whatsoever. Now, what Mishima has done so well in this novel is that he's given us Noboru at 13, right at the turning point of this illusion of a grand purpose in life. But he counterpoises that with Ryuji, the sailor, the very sailor who comes to be the emblem of this illusion. Ryuji is in his mid-30s, and he ends up giving up the seafaring life to settle down with Noboru's mother. And what's worse, he starts to study business and think about helping her run her shop and just in general doing what all dads do. And this is exactly what the gang despises. And so it's interesting to get this moment of the 13-year-old and this moment of the 34-year-old on two opposite sides of this thing that I think a lot of us go through and I personally identified with. All through my teens and 20s, I had this thing within me that constantly was pushing me to achieve some greatness, constantly go after some goal, some big thing that I was destined for. And eventually I had to realize that this was an emotion and a fervor that wasn't fixed to any real object at all. And while life was going on, I was stuck in this dreamland waiting for something that I didn't even know what it was to happen. Mishima so beautifully describes this innate yearning for some glory. At 20, he had been passionately certain. There's just one thing I'm destined for, and that's glory. That's right, glory. He had no idea what kind of glory he wanted or what kind he was suited for. He only knew that in the depths of the world's darkness was a point of light which had been provided for him alone and would draw near someday to irradiate him and no other. I'm also put in mind of Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment when, towards the end of the book, he says, simply living wasn't enough for me. And again, Ryuji is thinking, there must be a special destiny in store for me, a glittering special order kind no ordinary man would be permitted. And then later on, we get the moment of disillusionment from Ryuji. Time to realize that no specially tailored glory was waiting for him. Time, no matter if the feeble Eve's lamps still defied the green-gray light of morning by refusing to come awake to open his eyes. Mishima does such a great job of giving us the psyche of each of these principal characters. Fusako, the mother, Ryuji, the sailor, and Noboru, the young boy, such that there's a power and a tension that just builds and builds and builds throughout the book. And when we come to the moment when Noboru realizes that the symbol that Ryuji stood for has completely shattered, we feel a profound sense of dread, such that the very last line of the whole novel, glory, as anyone knows, is bitter stuff, lands with some of the most impact I've felt in the last line of a book in a very long time. Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters, a film by Paul Schrader. Please check it out. The Sailor Who Fell from Grace with the Sea by Yukio Mishima. Fantastic novel. Best Japanese novel I've read yet, although I haven't read many. But I'm moving on to other works in the Mishima oeuvre immediately.